Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, audience and listeners. This is James Kandasamy from Achieve Wealth Through Value at Real Estate Investing Podcast. Last week, we had Jake and Gino from Wheelbarrow Profit. Jake and Gino have tons and tons of deals on their own and you know, recently have moved into syndication space as well. And their story is just very interesting in terms of knowing how did they get started, how did they refinance their first deal to, you know, to launch their multifamily investing career. Uh, today, I have uh, Rich Fishman from Dallas. And uh, Rich has almost 8,000 units right now across 23 complexes. And he has been buying in Texas, Tennessee, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Mississippi, and South Carolina. So Rich is going to be talk- giving us a lot of valuable insights into how he have bought so many apartment units. Imagine half of that 8,000 units is fundamentally owned by Rich itself, and the other half of it is more of a partnership and syndication. Hey, Rich, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, James. I'm glad to be here. Good, good. It's going to be a very interesting podcast because and I'm going to be learning so much from you, and I'm sure my listeners is going to be uh, learning so much from you. And how did you get started? I mean, you have like 8,000 units right now. You started almost 20 years ago. So walk back. Did you get started in multifamily immediately when you get started in real estate? Well, actually, uh, I was the owner of a mortgage company in the San Francisco Bay Area in, in Berkeley, California. And I financed mostly half homes, but I also financed apartment complexes. And uh, I had a deal to finance. It was a sixplex in Alameda, California, and it was a foreclosure. Back then, there were a lot of foreclosures, uh, and the realtor gave me the deal. I got the loan, and then the buyer fell out of, uh, of escrow. They didn't like the deal, and then there was another buyer. Same thing happened, and I said to the uh, realtor, I said, what's wrong with this deal? It looks like it makes money. And she says, nothing's wrong with the deal. And I said, well, I don't manage anything like this. She says, well, I know a management company. Don't worry about it. So I went to the property. Then I dragged my wife there. And it's a funny story because my wife is from Scandinavia and they built very well there. And so we went to the property and we had one of those long, you know, those long screwdrivers that the termite guys have because we were poking around seeing if it was well built. And the screwdriver went right through the wood, <laughs> through the, into the drywall. And my wife says, I can't buy this with you. I said, no, we're buying this. And she looked at me and she said, okay. And so we bought this sixplex. And the sixplex was the beginning of us starting to buy real estate in earnest. So that's the story. Is we kind of side, there was a sidebar from the mortgage business. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I always wonder, like whenever I meet, you know, brokers, mortgage brokers, and even brokers, I always ask them, why not you guys buy these deals, right? Why are you just doing transaction? And, and a lot of times, uh, I mean, a lot, lot of times, I think once I talk to someone who has from a mortgage broker to become an investor, I think I'm sure you know him. It's like Michael Becker, right? Yeah, I think he's mm-hmm. a big buyer in Dallas. I asked him this question because he used to be working in Wells Fargo and he told me not everybody likes to take risk like a business owner, right? Uh, it's, it's not only about the risk that the main reason that people get into the investment side is because when you're doing transactions as a broker, you're making income and you're only as good as your last deal. You have to keep churning and closing deals to make a living. And every broker is off to the next listing or the mortgage person is off the next loan. And you live and die by the transaction. So eventually most people either say, I've got to own the stuff, build wealth rather than income. Or I'm not interested. I really don't want to own anything and take the risk and the responsibility of owning property. So that's the thing. I had to make a decision to own it, take care of it, use my free time 
because I was still a mortgage broker. I had to use my weekends to run the real estate with my wife want to get started because we had we couldn't just go into multifamily. We needed the income from the mortgage business. So it takes a lot of sacrifice for the first couple of years to get into something like this. Got it. Got it. So you, you must know the industry inner working as well in, in the mortgage and, uh, you know, to really successfully become owner and take advantage of that knowledge as well. So after how many years or after how many unit count that you, you said, okay, I'm going to give up this mortgage business. I'm going to be just a full-time uh, real estate investor. I think we hit about a thousand, a thousand apartments. And at that point, I uh, let go of my duties in the mortgage company and concentrated on just buying and selling apartments. Got it. Got it. So 20 years ago, you started buying the sixplex, right? And then uh, when, when did you see your fastest acceleration of you know purchases or acquisitions? Well, we hit about 4,000 units and then the recession came, 2009 to 14. 12, 13, depends on the area of the country. And that was really hard. So we didn't really grow during that period. We were selling off as fast as we were buying, just kind of just trying to keep our head above water. Uh, we got to about 5,000 units about three, two or three years ago. And then we've grown a lot more. I could probably have 50,000 apartments today if I wanted them. I would have to basically align myself with uh, someone on Wall Street uh, or some investment banking firm like the Goldman Sachs or or something like that. And they would be happy to raise the money uh, and give me all that money. And I could then own you know, 5 or 10% or 15% of whatever it is that is bought. I'm not that gun ho for that strategy. So the growth at this point is really about organic growth for me and our company and also quality of life. Because when you have institutional money, you have to take care of it in a way that suits the institutions. And they have requirements that family and friends and other people don't have. For example, they might want audited books every year. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot because we, we don't, you know, our books are clean and everything, but that just takes a lot of time to give to get an audit done. And if you multiply that by 15 or 20 deals, now you have to have a whole audit department and CPAs who work for you and things like that. So just so it's been it's been really about opportunity and raising money mostly from either my own resources or family and friends and other other methods. Got it. Got it. So, Rich, I think uh, you bring a really good perspective in terms of economic cycle, right? Because you have went through, I mean, you started 20 years ago, you went through that 2008 and everybody said 2008 multifamily, you know, fed better than any other asset classes. You know, there's very, very low, you know, who went into a receivership or bankruptcy, right? Multifamily, right? So is that is that true? That's not true at all. Okay. Uh, most of the people who are in multifamily today were not even involved in the in the business. Exactly, that's what I'm asking because every a lot of newbies and uh, a lot right. of people were wiped out in that recession, and a lot of other people were underwater. I mean, there were thousands of apartment complexes that were foreclosed on. Now, was it as bad as office buildings or retail? Maybe not. I I really don't know, but it, it was bad. Now they say. Anybody who lasted eight years <laughs> could come out the other side feeling good, but most people don't have the capital to take, you know, five or six or seven years of losses, you know, and large losses. If you're if you're not making debt coverage, if you're not able to pay your loan and you're coming out of pocket, that might be okay for one deal. But if you have 20 deals like that, you know, that's a whole different story. So it's a quite a different thing than what people say. Now, the multifamily was hit extremely hard. Uh, and I think the default ratio was up to about 8%. 8%? Okay. Yeah, I think so. That doesn't sound that bad compared to student loans, but if you think <laughs> about it, 8% is, you know, you're talking about 
housing that touches the lives of millions of people. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it's very interesting data because you are giving me true data. I mean, sometimes we read in the news and they say low delinquency rate and it was not hard hit and we don't have real true story, right? Because a lot of it depends on sub market, depends on which class we are talking about and, you know, depends on the operator as well. How did you survive the 2008 crash? Well, I had some properties that cash burned really well. And I had others that really couldn't survive and I got rid of them. You know, I sold them off or I actually uh, had to uh, cut my portfolio down in order to survive and retrench a little bit. But I only had a few deals that were like that. The rest, I didn't have the leverage. If you were totally leveraged up in a bad market, then you cannot save yourself because, and if you're a partnership, you can't save yourself either. Because if you own 10 or 20% of the deal and the, uh, the loan is negative, then you would actually have to make a capital call every month on your partners in order to make those payments. And if you raise money, you know that there's two words that should never be spoken. Capital call. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, it's hard to really get money out of people to feed something that's losing money. So there are a lot, there, there are a lot of people who gave, uh, I know one uh, fellow in the Houston market, he had property all over Houston, Atlanta. He, I think he gave about 40, 40, 40 deals back. Mm. You know? And there were other people like that, you know, who had just tremendous amount of deals that they gave back to the banks. So was this the, uh, when they give back, uh, did Fannie and Freddie was giving non-recourse loan at that time? They were non-recourse loans. They just won't, uh, if you give them money, if you give them deals back, they don't want to lend to you again. You okay. Know, unless you uh, pay a heavy penalty to offset their losses because they they take losses you know mm-hmm. themselves or the servicer takes a loss and in the in Fannie Mae's case the loan uh, originator slash servicer usually takes about five to ten percent of the risk of the loan so you know that could be pretty substantial too to them because they're usually owned companies by either private and individ- large wealthy individuals or by banks they don't like taking losses at all got it got it so they are some hopefully we won't be there again (laughs) yeah absolutely we we do not want to be there again so so it was non-recourse and the the owners were able to just give up their property they lose their equity and the servicer takes some loss and they give it back to fannie mae and that's it Uh, fannie mae then uh fannie mae never one of the problems with the way the system was set up is that Fannie Mae never really owned the loan. Mm. People don't realize this, but Fannie Mae is just a broker. Really? Okay. Yeah, so there's really like, you know, there's really like nobody, you know, it's not like someone in Mumbai who owns or in <laughs> Shanghai who owns all these loans. I mean, they basically securitize the uh, loans and they sell the loan as a bond mm-hmm. in the world financial markets. And so there's a special servicer who represents the interests of the bondholders, and that person is delegated decision making, but they're not able to cut deals from mm-hmm. Fannie Mae loan. So it's, they don't generally go and say, we see that you're negative and why don't we, why don't we go from 5% to 3% and you can owe us the money later things like that. They, they're, they're not flexible. Okay. So, so actually Freddie Mac is, is more flexible. They, they act more like a, a bank. And so they, they can, they can work, do workouts in a much better way than Fannie Mae can. It's just one of the things people don't know. Wow. That's interesting. That's a lot of information out there. Yeah. I mean, Fannie Mae does uh, securitize the loan and they sell it to the investor who buy it as a bond and they get a certain percentage out of it. And in the middle, the servicer, the Fannie Mae, everybody makes a few percent, I guess, on top of the 10 years. Everybody's price. making money. And at the end, the only people who generally lose money are the bondholders. Okay, are the bondholders. But if the deal is given back, I mean, the equity holder, whoever, the the owner also lose the money as well, right? So there's two people, the buyer and the seller. The, bar- the borrower absolutely loses all their entire investment. Mm. And then the lender... If the lender can't be made whole by the sale of the real estate, then they lose money too. Things okay. did get pretty bad in that cycle that that the uh, value of the property 
often sunk below the outstanding balance of the loan. Got but it. Got they're it. all negative things to talk about. Uh, let's, let's talk about more positive things. Got it. What about the, so you talked about people who are highly leveraged, right? So let's say you're buying a deal at 75% leverage. Do you think that's highly leveraged? I mean, can you define highly leveraged? What is the highest leverage uh, that you think? Well, in today's world, you can leverage up <laughs> to oh, even 90%. Mm -hmm. You know, if you put a first and a second or preferred equity, and yep. that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that you don't want to leverage that high on a stabilized property. It's one thing if you buy a property that's a value add and that you're going to add value and renovate a property, increase rents, increase value. Mm -hmm. And you're looking on a stabilized basis that, okay, you went high leverage, but within a year or two, you're going to be catching up. And Got it. Got the it. leverage point will be at 60 per, 65 or 75 percent or something. But if you're basically highly leveraged in a stabilized property without any value add, then if the rents go down five or ten percent, then you're underwater. You, mm. and you, you want to you want to have some protection. You want to certainly have twenty percent or you know debt coverage or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, that's that's the reason why I'm going with the question because we buy deals, uh, value at deals, even at 80% leverage, but in one to two years, that 80% leverage is going to be, you know, 70 to 65% leverage, right? So basically, it's not leverage at the start of the load, right? It's basically, you know, where are you going to be once you stabilize, right? Uh, that's the more important thing. And sometimes people get confused that you shouldn't be highly leveraged or why are you highly leveraged? Hey, you don't understand that. We are looking for buffer for DSCR, right? We want to be as further up from the debt service coverage ratio, right? That's the fundamental discussion about highly leverage and causing higher risk, right? But right, leverage is your friend if you're using the leverage to invest capital. If you're using leverage to service debt or to pay out dividends, then you're making a huge mistake. Okay, absolute point. That, that's, that's an awesome point. That's well said. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better, right? So what about the guys who have done breach loans at that time in 2008? What happened to them? And, you know, what would you give advice to that kind of uh, people who are doing I mean, they, they entered 2007 or 2008 with a value-add deal, and then they had a bridge, a bridge situation. Well, those people probably suffered. I mean, they didn't execute... If they executed, that's fine. You know, it was hard to push rents back then. Everything is based on increasing rent, right? Fundamental multifamily strategy is how can I increase the rent? Okay. What value can I give the tenant so they'll pay more? Now, I, between 2008 and 2012, there was the only value add strategy that I know that worked was to fix deferred maintenance and make sure you kept the lights on for the most part. Mm -hmm. So beyond that, I didn't see people putting granite countertops in and all this other stuff because everyone was just trying to survive. Those people, many of those people who got in at the cycle, at the end of the cycle, you know, didn't make money until, unless they stayed all the way through 2015, 16. So there was about seven years that you would have to stay in that deal in order to make it. Now, I did buy a property in the Midwest that I bought for about 15000 a unit. You can get things that way back then. And I bought it in 2006, and I did do really well on it. But it was unusual because I got it so cheap, and the, my basis never was very high. But at the time, it seemed like I had really jumped the shark, as they said, <laughs> you know, because the economy wasn't very good, and it, was, it wasn't easy to rent up any apartments for a while coming back to you know midwest which I, which i believe is more of a secondary or tertiary market right so like right now in 2019 right now market is so hot and people can't buy in this you know hot cities like dallas houston san antonio austin people are i mean i'm just looking at te texas right i mean we're in florida we have orlando tampa and uh, what Jacksonville and people, I mean, a lot of people have started going to other states and you know, tertiary market or states, which is like supposedly supposed to be upcoming, right? So what would you give advice to them? Well, I think my advice on the states like South Carolina or those kind of places is that to study the local market and make sure 
that it's vibrant, that there's good jobs there. You know, there's a lot of great secondary local tertiary markets, um, Huntsville, Alabama, or um, Hoover, Alabama, or, you know, you're dealing with the Greenville, Columbia, South Carolina. I mean, there's just, you know, Asheville, North Carolina. There's a lot of great secondary markets. I would, I think the biggest problem that people have in these markets is they, one is they think they can increase rents more than they can. Okay. Because if you go to some of these markets and you think you can get $200 for putting in a new kitchen, you might find out you can only get $35 and 20 cents, you know, because there's a limit to some, to what a lot of these people were willing to pay in these markets. And if you go too high, they just won't rent. But there's still some markets that are small that people are really surprised at. If you've been to Indiana and, you know, there's Columbus, Indiana, well, that sounds like a real nothing place, but uh, Cummins is located there. It's a very large company and it's a pristine town with fairly high rents. Bloomington is also a great town in Indiana. It's got the college there. So there's a lot of college towns and, you know, there's capitals and there's uh, places where there's a lot of uh, manufacturing that used, particularly in the southeast, that they didn't have manufacturing before. Some of these places have become very desirable for retirement uh, and for uh, businesses like uh, Charleston, South Carolina. It was nothing was going on there except history about 20 years ago. If you've been there now, they're building like homes like crazy. People are moving there to retire. Uh, there's a huge tourism business. It was, I think, ranked the number one wedding venue one year recently. Uh, and then they have, uh, they're making small planes there. Just tremendous amount of activity going on. What happened to this kind of tertiary market? I'm sure you had similar tertiary market during 2008, right? Where you thought, okay, this is really good to go in and invest. Looking at some of the cities that you're looking at it right now, what happened to that kind of market in 2008? How did they do compared to the major cities that is well known for appreciation? Well, I own a, a property. And the answer is differently. Every tertiary market was different, just like every major market. You know, for example, if you look at the major markets or the secondary major markets, take Tucson. Tucson was wiped out in the recession, and now people say it's a good investment. <laughs> Phoenix was wiped out. Vegas was wiped out. Reno was wiped out. Today, Reno, people think Reno is part of California. It's, you know, it's hard to buy something under 150 a door in Reno now. So back then it was fifty a thousand a door was a great a great time to exit. So uh, I own property in uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, and there is an army base there. Now I will never buy another property next to an army base. I don't care what the numbers look like because the politics of the army base are things that I cannot control. And they decided that army base that they didn't need hardly anymore. So they cut the cut the uh, enrollment at the army base there by about half, and it was the town dependent upon the army base almost completely. Not just the army people, but the people who were feeding the vendors and everybody else. And so the town really uh, rents went down about 30, 40 percent in the town. But then there is other locations. I owned a uh, property in Davenport, Iowa, and it got hit, but it didn't get hit that bad. And Agriculture, which was a real feeder for, for Iowa, st stayed pretty good. And, mm -hmm. you know, they had the ethanol, and that was pretty good. And, you know, we never got below, in general, 90% occupancy in the properties that we owned there. So it's it just really depends. You've got to do your research. Just no, you can't make a blanket and say, Tertiary market, secondary market, prime, you know, core core markets. You know, it wasn't long ago that people considered Baltimore to be almost a core market, you know, because of its proximity to DC on the Amtrak corridor from New York, the new harbor that they had built there with the aquarium, and you know, uh, and you know, today, you know, a lot of people don't think of Baltimore as a core market, you know, but. And back then, people didn't see D.C. as a core. They thought it was crime-ridden, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, stay away from D.C., you know. And now today, I mean, you're talking about very expensive real estate all over D.C. Awesome. Awesome. There's a lot of insights there. So, so Rachel, what has, which market have you been focusing on? I mean, you bought in a lot of markets before these and you probably own some of it over there. But what has your strategy has been at this uh, hot? Right now, my strategy is really to buy more in DFW. Okay. I, our office is here. This is probably the best multifamily market in the country. The cranes are all over the skyline. Uh, the jobs are coming in like crazy every day or a week. There's another multinational company that's relocating from California generally to DF, to Dallas, Fort Worth. There's a lot of vibrancy here. Rents keep tricking up. I just, you know, I, I like DFW. I've liked Houston a lot in the past. Houston's very spotty, though, and there's a lot. It, I can't just tell you that Houston's going to do well because every part of Houston is so different, and there's no zoning, so it doesn't have a character. Neighborhoods don't have as much character there that they do here. You know, Houston is great. Austin is great. It's just the real question isn't what do I like. The real question is, is there upside? You know, where is the upside in multifamily today? And the answer is that there isn't the kind of upside today that there was until a couple of years ago, because we were still basically catching up from the recession, a lack of housing, deferred maintenance, and household formation. During the recession, people said to me, aren't there going to be more renters? Because people were foreclosed. I don't know if you remember that. They all, mm -hmm. People would say, you must be, you're in a great business. All these foreclosures, they have to rent now. No, they didn't have to rent. They moved in with their families. They doubled <laughs> up. <laughs> Whatever they had to do, people are much more flexible and adaptable than statisticians and university professors. So people didn't create households. It, they stayed in the basement. And so here we are, 2012, wondering, where are all the renters? Well, it turns out that they were hiding out. So... <laughs> When the economy got good and they got jobs, they all came out, and that created a lot of uh, household formation, a lot more renters, and that created a boom in multifamily. So are there more and more people who need rental housing? Absolutely. And particularly in areas like, like Dallas, Fort Worth, where they're coming in for the jobs, they need housing. You know, Austin, they need housing. Uh, that puts pressure on rents, and they usually start building a lot more, too. So you know, the areas that have declining population... I wouldn't invest. So if I go, if I look up, a, if, if a deal's in a city that has a declining population, I, I automatically say, no, I'm not interested. Even if I could fix it up and make some money, it's to me, that's, I'm going against the tide. You know, I'm just one guy. I can't make an ocean. I exactly. have to get in my little boat and I have to have the, the, I want the ocean to work for me and not against me. I don't want to fight that. Same with crime. If I'm in an area that has just tremendous amount of crime, you know, some crime is part of life, but if it has a lot of crime, I don't want to own it because I can't do all the things necessary to stop crime in my neighborhood. I don't, I'm not a police department. I'm just one person owning one complex or two in a neighborhood, and I've got to have an ability to deliver safe housing to the people who rent from us. Got it. Got it. So just want to add one thing to the listeners and audience. If you want to find a city where there's declining or appreciating one free resources, which is very quick to check, is called bestplaces.net. Uh, bestplaces.net. And you can go and enter the, the city uh, information and you can go to household, I believe it's a real estate statistics and it'll show you whether the, there's a declining population or increasing population. I mean, in general, I think Texas is increasing in general everybody's moving to texas and i believe florida as well so right. i mean if you're looking in texas and you say well why don't i buy in amarillo or abilene or you know uh, these kind of places i don't have anything to say i don't know those markets those are but those are not vibrant places <laughs> okay. generally if you don't you, think says vibrant okay got it but i think the major cities in texas are pretty vibrant the major cities you know are really san antonio Austin, Houston, and Dallas. Then you have cities like El Paso, Lubbock, Tyler, you know, places like that that are in the second tier. Corpus Christi is another one that 
is in between a second and third tier city. I own actually in Corpus Christi uh, real estate. And that's on a lot of people's radar because they are putting a lot of money into the ports and the petroleum industry. But it's not as vibrant as San Antonio or Austin. Got it. Got it. Got it. But Dallas, I mean, I know you're focusing on Dallas, but Dallas prices have appreciated from what, 50000 a door. I mean, I think all over Texas is like this, right? For the past five years, 50000 a door to almost 100000 a door for a C-class property, right? So how are you planning to buy deals? I mean, since don't you think at some point the price per door is just going to be limited by the uh, rent uh, wage growth of the... Well, I think that it's a mistake to really focus on price per door. Mm-hmm. I think it's a better thing to focus on cap rates. Cap rates, okay. And if you could buy something over a five cap rate and put loan on it for under 4%, then you have positive arbitrage and you're going to make money. So a lot of properties are expensive, but you know, property in San Francisco is 350000 a door. Now, I was a mortgage broker there when they were going for 100000 a door and I thought people were crazy. Who would ever pay that? So, you know, we can't let a number, in, you, know, you shouldn't let a number per door impact your buying decision. What your buying decision should be based on is what return on your investment you're going to get. Now, it's true that you want to make sure there's an exit there, meaning that there's somebody else who would buy a property at more per door if that's a problem. Now, there are some markets where maybe that is an issue still, but they're generally very depressed, places like Detroit or things like that, uh, or Cleveland even. But even those places are not any more per door oriented. So I've seen deals recently that are 120, 130 a door. They were bought for 80 a door just three, four years ago. And before that, they were bought for 55 a door or so. And I don't really care what people bought them for in the past i just care can i what can i do what could what's my return going to be if i could hit my numbers then i don't really care now the question is can i hit my numbers am i chasing a dream that's or is the ship already sailed is there really any more room in this property to enhance value and the answer has to be yes and a lot of the areas in dallas are improving they're the income levels are going up in some of these places. The number of jobs in the area are going up. So they're not static environments. They're, today, a suburb of Dallas is not the same place as it was 20 years ago because now there's four times as many people living in the area, shopping in the area, working in the area, and those people are all competing for housing. So, okay. So how do you underwrite your deals? I mean, um, like when you, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're looking for upside, right? That's what you talk about in any deals and whether you can make return on your investment, well, right? Do you- I'll, I'll tell you my tricks of the trade, uh, which yeah. is nothing unusual. Is we, first of all, we go into the numbers and make sure we understand the expenses. And we also, we also increase the property taxes based on what we think the assessor will increase the taxes to. Because that's a very big thing. People don't realize they come from out of the outside Texas that your property is assessed every year, a new bank. So you can't look at a tax that your seller is paying and think that you're going to have the same tax. So we get the real expenses. And then if we're going to do a value add, we want to find a, a property that's very similar same vintage and everything that's already done the value add and see what rent they're achieving, what they've done. And we're not going to go past that. In other words, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a pioneer and decide that I need golden faucets or, you know, uh, you know, know, Berber carpets or whatever it is, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a nice value add the same as everybody else, maybe, or a little better. But I'm not going to guess that I can get more rent. So then, so that's where I get my revenue is just estimating how many units we're going to renovate, what rents can we get today, today in the marketplace, not tomorrow, and then use those numbers. And if those numbers show that I can get a great return based on what it costs and what the money we put into the property, then it's a go. If the numbers say there's nothing here, I can't. Get a return from doing this, or the rents are tapped out. 
that kind of thing, then I pass. And we use a model. We, I think we use the CRE model. The CRE model. We bought the model because we, it got too complicated for Excel for us. And so we use a model that, that we bought to oh, okay. program okay. the IRR and all that stuff. What about the uh, rent growth assumption? How do you usually uh, predict that? We don't put more than 2 or 3% a year in there. We're not looking to create false expectations. You know, 5% rent growth sounds nice, but, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, uh, studies in Houston show that there's been virtually no rent growth in two or three years in Houston. And every year they say that they had 4 or 5% rent growth. And I asked the realtors, where, where is the 4 or 5% rent growth that these reports say? And no, nobody seems to know where those where the data is coming. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, do you think we can get that 3% rent growth moving forward from now and the next five years? I mean, do you I think, think that's realistic? That, I think we can get the, th- the 2 or 3% rent growth. Okay. With doing just by doing nothing. If you're in a, a market that is strong. So it depends on the market as it well. It all depends on one thing and one thing only, which is wage growth in the market you own. Correct. I owned a lot of property in San Antonio, and there was virtually no wage growth in San Antonio. And I have property that I've owned there now six years, seven years, and the last two or three years, there's been virtually no increase in, 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 wage, in wage growth or you know, uh, rents in a lot of these markets. The cap rates keep going down, so people keep paying more for these properties. Mm-hmm. They expect rent, wage growth, and uh, rent growth. So everyone has a different expectation. Got it. Got it. Got it. So what about the? Um, I mean, you mentioned that you know you. I mean, you did this for twenty years. You own like you know eight thousand units. You could have multiplied ten x your holdings by going with private equity money, right? Which some uh, some uh, people have done, right? Uh, and and some people have gone to private equity and came back to be, hey, I want, I do not want them. Some people are trying to get into uh, working with private equity because you know it's easier to rather than raising money from you know retail investors, right? Which is like family and friends. Uh, you know, I know you mentioned some perspective, but can you give a full perspective on why you didn't choose that route at all? Well, I we do have family and friends and private equity and some family offices in our deals. Uh, I have uh, three deals that I have institutions in, and I just prefer the flexibility that I prefer working with with individuals and with people I know because it, multifamily is not it's not a straight line. You 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 buy something. A lot of times there are surprises after you close. You don't know some problems that you run into. Sometimes you have to replace staff. A lot of times you have a staffing issue. It could take a year or two longer to execute your business plan. And still, it's very good. You know, when you execute your business plan, you make a lot of money. But it could take, instead of it taking one or two years, it could take five years or four years. And when you have institutional money, they're not very patient. And they are very willing after, if you don't make your numbers for one or two years, they're very willing to take the management away or threaten you with your with cramming, taking away your investment, actually, or cramming down. They call it cram down to, to make the return. It can be pretty nasty. So that's one of the reasons. Uh, and it's getting easier to raise money uh, from family offices and privately. Uh, there's uh, a number of uh, crowdsourcing platforms that we've uh, we've done some crowdsourcing raising for a couple million dollars as an infill, you know, to fill in a partnership, you know, after the family and friends invest and we still have a couple million left. Well, we've been successful at raising that money there. We've also used preferred equity, which is kind of a hybrid deal. It's not secondary financing like mezzanine financing, but it's similar. What they do is there's a there's a pay they want a pay rate of around four to six percent, and then they want a complete return of, let's say, nine to eleven percent or twelve percent. And they take they'll take the difference when you sell the property or when you refinance. So 
It gives you more leverage, you might say, but it's not it's not partnership money. So you, it reduces the money that you have to raise as a partnership. Got it. Got it. What would you give advice to people who are saying that, you know, when the market turns, I mean, there will not be any more private uh, investors anymore. I mean, you have to go back to private equity. Do you think that's the true case? You mean institutional equity? You have to go back to from that's all private equity. I think the the reality is when the market turns, everyone goes back into their little clamshell, <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> regardless of what you call it. The money is money, and if people don't feel that they can make a return, then they won't invest. Now, what happens is that if the market turns and people are not making return, some deals will go south. You will go sour. And then you'll start a new cycle of distressed real estate. And then there'll be opportunity funds or vulture capital guys who are trying to invest in those deals and they'll be looking to invest. So every part of the cycle has a different kind of investor. Right now, the, the profile of the average investor is looking to clip coupons. Most people know that the glory days of making two, three hundred percent on their money is over. And they're very happy with what they've done. And now they really don't want to lose their principal. They've gotten more conservative, as wealthier people do. And then they say, well, can I get a seven or an eight percent or a six percent coupon clip every month where you send me a check? And there are a lot more of those people today. There are virtually none of those people in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> yeah, but today, most people have the uh, profile as investors of wanting to have lower risk and are willing to take less reward. So what you're saying is in 2008, everybody disappeared. Nobody invests uh, retail, right? And then after that, there is some vulture capital. And then now people are looking more into stabilized asset with lower risk. Guys, right? The people who appeared in 2008 were the people who worked at Goldman Sachs or Blackstone or these other Carlisle Group, you know, these other large accumulators of capital. And what they saw is a tremendous amount of uh, blood on the street, as they say. They saw just a lot of financial suffering, and they were looking and able, because of their um, a massive amounts of capital, to scoop up troubled assets for pennies on the dollar. So, when, so a lot of the Mortgages that went bad were sold off for 20, 30, 50% of their mortgage value to these conglomerate, these large companies. And then they went through the process foreclosing on individual assets. Some of them actually created management companies themselves and they got the properties back a, bu a bunch. And then they put them back on the market and made a lot of money. There was a lot of business, a lot of wealth created in that time frame. But it wasn't created by people like you and I. It was created in Goldman Sachs and, you know, in uh, Blackstone and these kind of places. Got it. Got it. So where do you think we are heading in the next, uh, you know, two, three years, five years? You know, are we going to have a slowdown bump or it's going to be a crash into like 2008 or we are just going to be keep on rolling in multifamily? I don't think that we're going to have a crash. I see it more that it's just a steady market and it's just going to, I just think it's going to go up and down a little bit here and there. And I don't see much change from where we are for a couple more years. I can't see out too far into the future. Sometimes politics and things like that intercede and, and we don't know if someone politically comes in and starts changing the tax code like they did in 1986 or something like that. But the way I see it is that America is fundamentally becoming a renter society. People are living a lot longer, and the longer people live, the less they want to own a house. Over the, the long, people will own houses and raise families there, but they will exit houses more and more frequently to live in places like central cities or small Main Street America, so they can be near services and doctors and entertainment. Uh, and quality of life. And I don't think that we're going to go back to the white picket fence for everybody environment. Now, that doesn't mean people won't buy houses, but when people are not raising children, they will prefer generally to live in smaller environments 
more like Europeans do. And I think that that portends well for multifamily. I, there's so many good trends that, so, that are feeding into the multifamily trough that I can't imagine right now that in general multifamily would have a crash. Got it. Got it. And uh, so we're coming almost to the end of the show. Can you give us one advice to people who are thinking of becoming like you, owning thousands of units and they're get, just getting started? Sure. So this is my main piece of advice is that if you, if you want to be in this realm, then you must make it a full-time job. This is not an investment. Because multifamily is not a stock. That you, it's not putting money on Microsoft and watching it go up and down. It's an active business. And if you're going to try to be somebody who owns several apartment complexes, then you just really can't buy the complexes and hand away the keys to the management company and expect great results. You have to be very active involved, visit your properties, know the rents in the market, walk vacant apartments. Make sure you hire good people. It really is a business. And if you're not prepared because of your lifestyle, your other job, or something like that, to devote most of your time to this business, then my recommendation is become a limited partner in a deal or two. Try to make money that way. But don't think that you could become a principal and own five or 10,000 apartments that way. No, it's not going to happen. Got it. And what about one, uh, I mean, this is one of the requests from our listeners. Is there any one advice that you want to give to passive investor who are investing in this deal, what they should look for? Before they well, the passive? biggest issue for passive investors is that they should really understand what they're investing in, like any other investment, and not take the, uh, the offering that they get from the company or the, the operator at its at its face value because it could be too optimistic. Uh, you want to make sure you agree with the assumptions. So you would probably, at the very least, get on the computer and look how much are units really renting for in that area. You know, if they're going to renovate, well, what does a renovated unit look for? Is this an achievable rent that they're projecting? And are their expenses realistic? Did they did are they in line with what expenses really should be? So do a little homework. That's my main thing. Don't, you know, and don't just trust that just because somebody sent you something that said that there's a 30% return, that that's a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. I've many, many times some passive investors just look at the final return numbers and decide whether they want to invest or not. But they forgot this. We are, we are making thousands of assumptions in that spreadsheet, right? So you rather check the assumptions rather than just the final numbers. Absolutely. Right. So, hey, Rich, uh, Really happy to have you here. How can the listeners and audience uh, reach out to you? Well, they could. Uh, we have a website, valcapgroup.com, and they can send me an email through there if they want to know about our upcoming deals. We'd be happy to put them on their list and work with them, talk to them, and uh, see if we can do some business together. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Trish, for coming on to the show. Uh, Thanks, James. It's been a pleasure pleasure to have you. Thank you. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audiobook. It's the audio version of his best-selling book on passive investing. You can get the audiobook completely free, along with other valuable resources, by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.